So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the DeFord Lecture Series. My name is Elizabeth Catlos and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geological Sciences at UT Austin. We are part of the Jackson School of Geosciences and the DeFord Lecture Series is our departmental seminar series. It's been a requirement and tradition for all graduate students since the late 1940s. The lecture series is named after Professor Ronald DeFord, who joined the university as a professor in 1948 with the purpose of enhancing the quality of the graduate program in the department. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. The chat's been disabled, but the Q&A is available throughout the presentation. Um, we'll bring them up after the talk. Also, the recording of the talk will be posted on the DeFord website, and we'd like to encourage you to share it with your social networks. Our speaker will be introduced by Dr. Rich Ketchum, who's a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. Rich? Okay, hello, everybody. Um, we're, I'm very happy today to be introducing uh, Dr. Jamie Barnes. Uh, Jamie actually started her academic career with us in the uh, Department of Geological Sciences and got her BS in 2000 and also a BA in UT's Plan 2 program. And she even did, did an honors thesis with uh, our own professor emeritus, Bill Carlson. She then went off to New Mexico, University of New Mexico and got her master's with Jane Silverstone in 2002 and her PhD in 2006 with Jane Silverstone and, and uh, Zach Sharp. And she stayed there to do a postdoc till 2009, during which she got some pretty cool sounding awards like the L'Oreal USA Women in Science Fellowship and the 2009 GSA Subaru Outstanding Woman in Science Award. And so that um, helped get her a job here. We're very happy to have her back starting in 2009. And she got promoted to associate professor in 2015. Um, she's Jamie is one of our outstanding educators, as you'll see from her lecturing style. She was an inaugural member of the UT Society for Teaching Excellence in 2011 and a three-time Knievel Award winner. She also won the Jackson School Outstanding Educator Award in 2013. And in 2018, 2019, she was the uh, NSF Geoprism's Distinguished Lecturer, giving lectures all around the country for that program. Uh, she's also one of our best departmental citizens, uh, has done service galore. She's the head of the LDE program, has been the assistant graduate advisor since 2012 through at least four different graduate advisors, and co-runs our undergraduate program, honors program with Dr. Mark Luce. So I'm happy you're all here today, and I'm eager to see your talk, so I'm going to hand it over to Jamie. Thanks, Rich, and thanks, Liz. Um, so hopefully you guys can see all of us. I'm not super tech savvy, but hopefully we got it going now. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about um, some work that I've been thinking about for the last several years and I'm currently working on and then a little bit of things that I want to continue on into the future. So um, I'm going to talk about the role of the fork in fluid mobile element cycling through subduction zones, mainly going to be focusing on the halogen elements, but we'll throw in some lithium and boron for fun. Um, my title slide here is um, from the Forearc of New, Ze of New Zealand. Um, and so these are some of these cold springs I'm going to talk about at the end of the talk. This is Mangapakia, and you'll notice that I do not have a scale in here on purpose um, to make it look more impressive than it is. But this comes up to about my knee or a little bit above my knee. Um, and so this is one of these cold springs, and there are these really weird features that I'm going to talk about. Um, before I get started, um, I want to just put up a list of lots of collaborators. All of these folks um, here have helped me um, throughout the last several years and with a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about and present today. So I'm not going to go through all of them here, but hopefully as the talk goes along, I'd like to acknowledge all of their contributions, but I put them here so I make sure that they are mentioned. And then the other thing I need to make sure that um, I acknowledge many New Zealand landowners and especially the Iwi Council in New Zealand who um, graciously gave me um, permission to sample their waters, to borrow their waters. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move this because I gotta move Rich and Liz because they're overlapping on my, <laughs> on my screen here. Okay, so I will, um, 
The first part of my talk today is just going to be giving an overview of our current knowledge, our state of knowledge, thinking about fluid mobile element cycling through subduction zones. So I'm mainly going to focus on the halogens, um, but I'll mention a little bit of boron and lithium. And so I'm going to be talking about inputs into the subduction zones, both in terms of means and amounts. So I'm talking about concentrations within the individual reservoirs, thinking about sediments, altered oceanic crust, serpentinized lithosphere, and then the total amount. So we have a concentration in each of those different reservoirs, but then we also have relative proportions of those reservoirs that are being subducted. So what is the budget going into the subduction zone? What's going to happen as we have prograde metamorphism and those hydrous minerals break down and we're going to lose these fluid mobile elements. So we're gonna think about how much of those elements are lost during subduction and what are the consequences for that loss. And then we're gonna look a little bit about outputs from subduction zones, mainly focusing where we have most of our data is on arc volcanoes. So thinking about melt inclusion and gas data and trying to look at inputs and outputs and think about in addition to what we know, then I wanna spend the second half of the talk talking about what we don't know. And so I wanna point out where I think some of the gaps in our knowledge are, particularly that about loss through the forearc and try to help fill in some of those gaps, okay? So before we get started, we need to think about, so why do we care? Why do I care? Why should you guys care? And so this is a highlight from um, the Deep Carbon Observatory, and they're highlighting a paper that came out, not my paper, but a paper by Mike Broadley and some collaborators that came out a little over a year ago. And I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, Does, did a burst of halogens kick off the end Permian extinction? Directly following a massive and prolonged series of volcanic eruptions about 250 million years ago, the end Permian extinction began the most severe die-off in Earth's history. An analysis of rocks that came to the surface before and after the eruptions suggests that they unleashed a vast stockpile of halogens from the lithosphere, which likely eroded the ozone layer, ozone layer and contributed to mass extinction. And so this is the paper that they're highlighting where they looked at halogen concentrations and mantle xenoliths um, from uh, the Siberian large igneous provinces and they show that there's all high concentrations prior to this extinction event lose about 70 percent of the halogens afterwards and so argue that you released all these halogens into the atmosphere that helped erode the ozone layer and led to mass extinction so one of the reasons you should care is that halogens can be partially responsible for mass extinction events so i put this in here to get the paleontologists excited and Rowan should be excited now because we're talking about mass extinction events in a geochemistry talk. So in addition to why we should care, one of the reasons that I'm interested in the halogens is that they're hydrophilic. These are fluid mobile elements, so they're tracking with water. So I'm interested to see where the water is coming from and where it's going and thinking about different sources. We, um, the halogens, particularly chlorine, also affects the transport efficiency of different trace elements particularly that of metals. They also affect, particularly chlorine affects the stability fields of different minerals. So it lowers the water activity. So dehydration reactions are gonna occur at shallower depths. And then I just gave this an example of the atmosphere, but they can influence the chemical evolution of the mantle, the oceans and the atmosphere. Okay. So like I said, the very first part of my talk is gonna be thinking about just an overview of our current state of knowledge and then we'll start thinking about what we know and what we, and what we don't know, okay? So we're gonna focus on three different inputs into the subduction zones. For the purposes here, I'm going to ignore um, sedimentary pore fluid. Those are likely or commonly thought to be lost at very shallow levels, about less than 15 kilometers depth in the subduction zone. We'll come back to that later, but we're gonna ignore them for right here. And so we're gonna think about uh, sediments, altered oceanic crust, and serpentinites, okay? And so um, we have concentration data for chlorine, fluorine, and bromine for these different reservoirs. Not a whole lot of data. So for sediments, there's some data on the chlorine and fluorine concentrations, but not that much on bromine and iodine. Altered oceanic crust, we know that uh, 
chlorine and fluorine can get into a lot of secondary um, alteration minerals like amphibol, but there's very, very little data on bromine and iodine. And then there's been a lot of work that shows that serpentinites can host a large amount of chlorine, some fluorine, and recently some really nice work by Mark Kendrick and others have shown that serpentinite can actually host quite a bit of iodine. So we're starting to get glimpses of the concentrations in these different reservoirs, but then we have to think about what that means in, total, in terms of total input flux. And so we can do just some basic assumptions assuming subduction rates and the density of the material and how much taking a global average of how much sediments being subducted, altered oceanic crust and serpentinites and make some mass balance calculations into the total input. So you can see that altered oceanic crust really plays a large role in the budget for the subduction of chlorine and fluorine, um, where sediments maybe play a bigger role in bromine and iodine. But again, some of this really depends on what we're assuming for serpentinization of the oceanic lithospheric mantle, for example. So this is assuming about 5% serpentinization. If you assume greater than that, this serpentinite wedge is gonna become much, much more important, okay? So one of the things that folks can do is to look at um, different halogen ratios in order to pinpoint different sources. And so a lot of this is still a work in progress. There's a lot of folks in the halogen community that are still working on this. So this is some data that I've taken compiled from Mark Kendrick and Tim Yon. And you can see that we're starting to get an idea of what more of an OIB is. Um, I've got sediments. We have an idea for where the sediment field is, serpentinites, sedimentary pore fluids. I have a question mark next to altered oceanic crust, but we're starting to get some more ideas of this. So we can actually use the ratios to pinpoint different reservoirs, okay? And so this is gonna become important later on in the talk. Okay, so one of the things that we're thinking about is that, so we have an idea of the concentrations and the input and what's going in. But then what happens as this material gets subducted? So as you under increase the temperature and pressure, you're gonna break down some of these minerals and lose the halogens. So what percentage of halogens are actually reaching depths of arc magnogenesis and are any of them subducted beyond the arc magnetic front? Okay. So in order to do this, we need to look at exhumed metamorphic rocks. And so I'm gonna show you some of my work and some work by others. Um, part of this is coming from a review manuscript that I've written with collaborators. And so the first um, reservoir that I want to look at is serpentinites. And so this is largely based on work by Marco Scambolori and other, and Marco helped me write and made these figures for this review compilation. So Marco spends a lot of time thinking about serpentinites in the Western Alps. And so as you subduct serpentinites, they undergo these different phase transformations. And so here we have a diagram on the right-hand side that's just showing temperature on the x-axis, pressure on the y-axis. And so our different stars are different samples of serpentinite, starting with chrysotil down here in the lower left corner, up to antigrate, and then break down into antigrate where you get secondary olivine forming. And so what we can do is then look at these fluid mobile element concentrations in these different um, grades of serpentinites, okay? And so on the left-hand side here, we have chlorine on the y-axis and boron on the x-axis. And if you start with the value of a mantle olivine down here in the lower left, and you serpentinize it at uh, lower temperatures and pressures on the bottom of the seafloor, you can greatly increase the chlorine concentration and the boron concentration. And then if you subduct that serpentinite, okay, you start to lose some of the chlorine and lose some of the boron, okay? And you can still end up with slightly more boron than you started with and slightly more chlorine than you started with. And then here's an example just looking at chlorine concentrations with increasing pressure. And so you're losing some of the chlorine, but we're starting to quantify how much. This is some work that I've done looking at halogen loss, starting with sediments and looking at um, high pressure metasediments. So this is work that was done in collaboration with Gray Bebout and Sarah Peniston Dorland and Philippa Gard. And we looked at a suite of samples from the Catalina Schist and then also, also from the Schist de Lustres and Lago di Cignana in Italy. And I realized that I'm mixing two different <laughs> subduction zone complexes, but the idea was to just see 
is there, what is the general trend with prograde metamorphism? And so if you start with an average marine sediment, okay, so this is thinking about a global average, pretty high concentration of chlorine, about 600 ppm, lithium is about 45 ppm. And at fairly low temperatures and pressures, you can still preserve, preserve a lot of that chlorine and lithium. And then as you increase during prograde metamorphism, by the time we get down here to pretty high pressure conditions, so this would be samples from Lago di Chiana, you've lost most of the chlorine, but you still retain quite a bit of lithium, about half of it, okay? And so we're starting to, again, try to quantify how much we're losing and where we're losing it along this prograde path. In terms of halogen loss from altered oceanic crust, I'm actually um, not going to say anything on this. I'm going to leave this as a teaser. So this is uh, Grace's PhD work. And so in the coming year, Grace is going to present what she's found by looking at some samples from the seafloor and also from the Western Alps that she's been working on as part of this NSF um, Partnerships and International Research Experience grant. Okay. okay. So we, I've shown you that with prograde metamorphism, we're actually losing some of this chlorine along the way, a lot of the chlorine along the way. So what are some of the consequences for that halogen loss? So we're particularly thinking about saline fluids here, okay? And so one of the things that happens is that you can delay the onset of slab melting. So it's gonna melt at a higher temperature. Lots of dehydration reactions are going to occur at lower temperatures, so shallower depths. And if you have high enough concentrations of CO2 and of salt, you can actually get um, an immiscibility gap. You can get two fluid phases and produce a brine. And this is where I have started to get interested in because that brine can then transport metals. And so one of the things that I and Craig Manning were interested in was well, what are the effects of subduction zone pressure and temperature on the concentration of these different solutes? And so again, this is part of this halogen review chapter that I worked on with a bunch of collaborators and Craig helped, well, actually Craig did all of the modeling. So Craig did a lot of the thermodynamic modeling to think about um, how do, how do these concentrations change in different subduction zones as a function, as a function of their geotherm? And so what he did was to look at two different end member subduction zones. So we looked at Cascadia here on the right and Alaska here on the left. Cascadia is going to be the warmer end, end member. Alaska is the cooler end member. We're using the CRQ's um, geothermal model. So looking at the temperatures at the top of the slab on the top of the sediment pile. Okay. And here we have the equilibrium constant for a reaction of a divalent um, cation. So we're looking at a metal here with chlorine along the top of that um, subduction interface, okay? And so we're using some new geothermal models that allow us to look at, um, uh, to be able to quantify some of these um, concentrations. And so on the y-axis, y we have log K, and on the x-axis, we have temperature. And so in Cascadia, you're at a higher temperature at a given depth. And one thing that we're trying to show here is that if you add chlorine, you increase the metal transport. It's not a large effect, but at a given temperature, you can see that the metal is slightly higher. And so one thing that I think would be fun for future research is to actually then go and look in some of these subduction zones, whether they're melt inclusions or not, and see if you actually have higher metal concentrations in some of these between subduction zones with different geothermal parameters. Okay. So we know that we're losing halogens along this prograde path, and that has important implications for the physical properties and solute structure of that fluid. But we also know that we're actually getting halogens down to depths of arc mag magnogenesis. And so this is a compilation that I put together. None of this is my data, um, but it's a compilation that I put together looking at chlorine and fluorine and olivine hosted melt inclusions from arc basalt. Okay. So in the gray, I show um, the value for morph. And then all these different colors are from different subduction zones. And in some cases, I've highlighted individual volcanoes. Um, and so you can see that the chlorine and the fluorine concentrations are higher or enriched compared to morph. And so this is commonly cited as evidence for contribution of slab-derived fluids to arc volcanisms. 
We don't get a smoking gun a lot of times in the sciences, but this is considered to be one of those. Okay. So we're getting some halogens down to depths of arc magnogenesis. And so then what I've done here is to make uh, a diagram where on the x-axis we show arc inputs. So I've made some calculations that I've showed you at the beginning. Um, but then also other folks have done the similar things, okay? And so those are shown on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis is arc outputs of the different halogens. Most of the arc outputs is going to be based on volcanic gas data. Um, there's one study that has looked at halogens and melt inclusions and tried to scale it up. And surprisingly, it matches the gas data fairly well. And so this black solid line right here is the one-to-one -one line. And all of the halogens fall below that line, okay? So it's, um, and so what we can see from this is that chlorine is the closest to the line. It's the most efficiently recycled. So it means as most of it that's going down is coming back up. And fluorine is the least efficiently recycled. It is decoupled from chlorine. I'm not the first person to say this, several people also has, have observed this and called this out. Um, as a community, we still are not sure why. So this is one of the things that a lot of folks are working out, looking at is why does chlorine seem to be decoupled from fluorine? One of the reasons could be that fluorine is more soluble and normally in hydrous minerals. So maybe you can actually sequester some of it in the subducting slab. Fluorine will probably still go into like amphiboles more than chlorine, or maybe get sequestered in some minerals like clinotitan or humite. The second one is that you see that um, bromine and iodine is falling below this line. And I would argue that I don't think that you're bringing in a whole lot of bromine and iodine into the upper mantle. I argue that I think that this is reflected by shallow loss of bromine and iodine prior to the arc volcanic front. I think that we're missing some outputs. And so I'm going to talk about that in the second. Um, I have briefly mentioned uh, boron and lithium, and I haven't gone into details, but boron looks very, very similar to chlorine. It's almost completely recycled to the Earth's surface, um, and lithium is less well understood, um, so we can actually subduct lithium quite a ways without much loss into the subduction zone. Okay. So this is thinking about the arc volcanic front. But if we look past the arc volcanic front, again, this is some data that I've compiled look from back arc basalt glasses. So chlorine, bromine, fluorine, and iodine. There's not very many studies that have looked at fluorine and iodine, but there's a few. And again, the gray is morb. And what you see is that these back arc glasses all have higher concentrations than morb. So even though we've lost a lot of those halogens on this prograde path, we still can re, um, bring some of them into the upper mantle past the arc volcanic front. So that's the first part of the talk. And so hopefully you guys have a better understanding of what's coming in and what's going out. But I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about what are we missing? What are those gaps? And how I'm working to try to help fill in those gaps. So one of the things I will argue is that we're still, we're getting a better handle on volatile loss or fluid mobile element loss along this prograde path, but there's still a lot of work to do, particularly in altered oceanic crust and looking at this deeply subducted res residue. So what is left behind, what is locked up in these normally anhydrous minerals, thinking about looking at natural samples. I will also argue that I think that we can uh, sequester um, a halogens in the con continental crust. We still don't have very good idea of the halogen budget of the continental crust. We know we can get magma ponding in the crust. We can get production and migration of halogen bearing fluid phases. We got a lot of metal ore deposits. So all of these are evidence of halogens, but we still don't have a great idea of the budget. Um, I will also argue that one output that gets overlooked is that of the forearc. And there's places where we get these forearc cold and thermal springs that we can be losing some of these fluid mobile elements through. And then the last one is what is getting sequestered in the subcontinental lithospheric mantle? What is getting sucked up in the lithospheric mantle? 
So for the rest of this talk, I am going to focus on the floor arc. And so the, um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about and worrying about is if I'm measuring these fluid mobile elements or these volatile elements in these floor arc springs, is that telling me, is that telling us about source? And what I mean by source, I mean by fluids coming off and elements coming off the subducting slab. So is this telling us where they're coming from in the subducting slab? Or is all of this masked by some sort of secondary process? So by some local fluid rock interaction where you're getting overprinting of the subducted signature, okay? So in order to think about and start to quantify outputs from these springs, we need to think about source of process and we needed to go look at some samples. And so the first place we're gonna go is Cascadia. And so I'm gonna look at some thermal springs that are located about 60 to 80 kilometers above the subducting slab. And then we're gonna go to New Zealand and look at some cold springs that are located about 15 kilometers above the subducting slab. So looking at a deeper part of the fork and then looking at a shallower part of the fork. Okay, so the first place we're gonna go is Cascadia. So this is some work um, that was done by Jeff Cullen several years ago in collaboration with Shell Hurwitz and um, Bill Lehman. Okay, and so what Jeff did was to sample 28 thermal or mineral springs along 90 kilometers along strike from Northern California to Oregon and into Washington. Um, and these dashed lines right here show the depth of the subducting slab. So this is about 40 kilometers, 60, 80, and then underneath the arc volcanic front right here, we're about at 100. Okay, so Jeff sampled 28 of these springs. And then we wanted to know what the composition of the lavas that were underlying them and that were hosting a lot of these springs. So we looked at eight well-characterized sample, uh, characterized lavas. Um, that had been previously studied by Bill Lehman. So most of these were basalts, one day site. Right there. Okay, and so there had been um, some work on these springs before, lots of oxygen and hydrogen work that have shown that they're meteoric and water in composition. Our data says the same. But then the question was, where is the chlorine coming from? So it had been known that some of these springs have really high chlorine concentrations, up to about 19,000 per mil. And folks have pondered for a while, especially folks at the USGS, is where is the chlorine coming from? So we looked at chlorine concentrations in the water. They reach up to about 19,000 per mil. Um, and then in the lavas, they're about 20 to about 160, okay? The other thing we did was to look at the chlorine isotopic values of the water, and they range from about zero to two per mil, and the lavas are about zero to 0.8 per mil, okay? On the uh, left-hand side, I have the chlorine isotopic composition on the x-axis. This green line is seawater, seawater is zero, it's defined to be zero. And then all these different dots are the springs that Jeff sampled. And if it's blue, then it has high concentrations of chlorine. And if it's red, it has low concentrations of chlorine. And what you can see right off the bat is that there's not a trend between the isotopic composition and the concentration. And there's also not a trend along the length of the arc. So the other thing that we did was to think about what are the possible chlorine sources. So some of the things that have been proposed before is that um, the chlorine is largely coming from seawater or sea spray. It is being leached out of underlying sediments. It's being leached out of underlining basalts. And then some people have argued that there's a small component that's actually coming from the subducting slab. So what we did was to um, look at the chlorine, boron, and bromine concentrations in these fluids as well, and to look at their ratios. And so again, the red and the blue dots are the spring samples that I showed you on the previous slide. The um, solid black line are those Columbia uh, transect basalts that we sampled and analyzed. But seawater is the dashed blue line here. The triangles are samples um, from other Cascade Springs, so data from folks from the USGS. The uh, diamonds are from Lawson, and uh, the crosses are from Mount St. Helens Springs, 
and then the yellow fields are gas condensates from Mount St. Helens, okay? And so what we can see is that if we just look on the left-hand side, we've got chlorine over boron, okay? Seawater's right here. None of our samples, with the exception of Boswell, fall on that line. So Boswell, the chlorine is actually probably coming from seawater. It has really, really high concentrations. It also matches their chlorine isotopic composition. But everything else doesn't match that of seawater. They're pretty close to that of the basalts. Uh, most of the marine sediments are isotopically negative. All of our values are isotopically positive. So just based on the chlorine isotopes, it doesn't seem like the sediments are playing a large component. If we look over here on the right hand side, we've got chlorine versus bromine, okay? And there's, um, you can also see that all of the dots lined up with that of the basalt. So just based on the chlorine isotopic composition, there's some overlap and the chlorine to boron and chlorine to bromine ratios is starting to look like some of the chlorine may be coming from the underlying basalt. And so what I did was to do a very, a very simplistic isotope mass balance model where we're looking at a volume of water is going to infiltrate a volume of rock. It's going to reach equilibrium. So we're assuming equilibrium. And you need to make some assumptions. So we need to know a water rock ratio. We need to know the distribution coefficient of chlorine between that rock and the water. We need to assume a temperature of interaction and then have an idea of the initial concentration, uh, isotopic composition of the rock and the water, okay? And so making some assumptions, what I did was to make some very simplistic models. And so on the, y, on the y axis, I have the chlorine isotopic composition of these different fluids, right? And they, so still the red and the blue are those spring fluids. And on the x axis, we have chlorine concentration. And then these solid black line is just looking at a basalt, okay, with different uh, distribution coefficients and then different water rock ratios are the different tick marks. And then the gray lines are assuming a different starting composition in terms of the isotopic composition of the basalt. So these are altered basalts, so they have a different um, higher chlorine concentration and different isotopic composition. And so what we can see from this is that just this very simple modeling can explain most of the data, except for the ones that have these really high values. So once you get starting to get a chlorine isotopic value greater than about one per mil, it's hard to explain just by interaction with the uh, host basalt. So based on this, we can conclude that a large part of the chlorine is coming from local water rock interaction, but there is a magmatic component. When you actually have magmatic degassing where you're producing HCl, you can fractionate the chlorine isotopes a little bit, which will lead to this artificially high value. So it was an interesting study, but I was still interested in looking at the slab fluid component. And so one of the things we learned in Cascadia was that these are thermal springs. And so you have a lot more of this um, overprinting process, the local overprinting process. So what we did then was to go to New Zealand where we could look at these cold springs that are located on the shallow part, above the shallow part of the subduction zone. So in New Zealand, here we're looking at these cold springs. This is an example of what one of them looks like. Um, this is probably the most spectacular one. Um, this is on the south end of the North Island of New Zealand. And I'll show you lots of pictures of what these guys look like. So one of the cool things about New Zealand is that um, you're subducting the Hickorangi Plateau, so you're jacking up the fork. And so you actually get these cold springs that are not very far above the subduction zone exposed on land. Most places, these, these are um, underneath the water. So on the left hand side, this is a diagram from uh, an image from Agnes Reyes. And so she's just outlining where all these different thermal springs and cold springs are in New Zealand. This dashed uh, red box right here is highlighting all of these cold springs and the fork right here. So we're subducting this Pacific plate at the Hickorangi Trench. You're uh, subducting the Hickorangi Plateau. And so you're lifting up this fork. And so these are exposed on land, okay? Um, on the right-hand side is a diagram from Laura Wallace. And one of the things that Laura is showing here is that you get changes in um, 
sub subduction parameters along strike of this North Island. So in the north, you've got a shallow slow slip event, and in the, in the um, south, you've got more interseismic coupling. Um, you have lots of seamounts that are subducting, and in the north, fewer seamounts that are subducting in the south. You're increasing the amount of sediment that is being subducted as you go from the north to the south. You're increasing the convergent rate, and as I'm going to show you in a minute, you're actually changing the concentration of some of these elements in the springs. And so one of the things that I got really interested in is given these along strike variations along the subduction zone, is there going to be variations in the slab derived fluid component to the springs? Um, so, and then if so, is there a change in the slab derived fluid source along the length of the margin? So for example, are sediments dehydrating in the north and not in the south or vice versa, for example, okay? And then is there a link between this change, if there is one, in slab derived fluids along the length of the arc and the change in the slip behavior where you've got slower slip in the north and the stick slip behavior in the south, okay? So in order to answer these questions, we're gonna use some geochemistry. So we're gonna look at the cation and anion concentrations and their ratios, and then we're gonna look at stable isotopes. So we're gonna, um, I'm not going to show you any of the oxygen and hydrogen today, but we're going to look at the chlorine and the boron and the lithium. Okay. So what we did was to do several sampling campaigns with collaborators in New Zealand. Um, so Sean Barker helped a lot with this, and then um, Laura Wallace has been involved with this work um, as well. Um, and then lots of people helped me with the geochemical analyses. So these samples were largely uh, sampled by uh, Jeff again. Um, and what Jeff did, we did several sampling campaigns to look at 18 different spring systems along um, this margin. Two of them are thermal, so Tapuia and Moreri are thermal, and then the 16 other ones are cold. So that means when I say cold, there means that they're at mean ambient temperature or lower, okay? Thermal generally are about eight degrees C or higher than ambient temperature. And this is an example of what some of these look like. Um, they tend to be, um, some of them don't flow year round. They can also move around a little bit. The flow rates can change, but we try to go back to the same sampling site and to the same pool if it was still there over the course of a couple of years. So this is not my work. This is part of the reason that I got excited about this project is that there was a couple of studies that have actually done a little bit of chemistry on some of these springs. Um, so here we're going from the north to the south along the length of the margin and we're looking at chlorine, bromine, iodine, strontium, lithium, and boron concentrations in these springs. Um, the gray dashed lines are those two thermal springs and they're about 50 degrees C, 50, 60 degrees C. And then everything else is a cold spring, okay? And so what I started to get excited about was it looked like there's some of these trends in the concentrations from north to south. So is that telling us something about a change in the uh, slab fluid source? Okay. So the black dots are samples that we collected and data from these. So we try to resample some of the same systems as before, and we've also found some new systems. Um, and we see the same trends. So there is a st statistically significant trend from north to south in chlorine, strontium, lithium, and boron, not in bromine and iodine. And then the other thing that should pop out to you is that there's some highs in the center of the margin, okay? This had been pre previously noted by um, Gigenbach, and he actually did a little bit of helium work on this to show that there was more uh, of a mantle signature in those springs. And so he argued that there was actually a conduit into the mantle wedge in these uh, areas. I also want to point out that you get high concentrations in some of these springs regardless of whether they're thermal or not. So for example, right here on the left, this is a thermal spring, but just right by it is a cold spring and you also see these high springs. So they don't necessarily seem to be linked just to the temperature of the spring. Okay. So what we did was first to look at some of the halogen ratios and also link in the boron and the chlorine. So again, on the x-axis, we're looking at latitude going from north to south. 
And we're gonna look at bromine over chlorine, iodine over chlorine, boron over chlorine, and lithium over boron. And in each of those cases, I put where sea level or seawater is, just so you guys have a reference point, okay? And so if we just look at bromine over chlorine, there's actually not that much of a range in the values um, compared to say iodine over chlorine. So they're pretty close to that of overlaps with that of sediments and also uh, sedimentary pore fluids. If we go over here to iodine over chlorine, there's more variability, but they still largely match with the sedimentary pore fluid or sediment. If we go over here to boron over chlorine, they match pretty close. The uh, ones down towards the bottom match what we'd expect for sedimentary pore fluids. Um, and then sediments are off scale. They have higher uh, boron concentrations. So maybe we're actually getting some sort of mixing. And then over here on the right hand side, lithium looks very similar. Lower values match what we'd expect for sediments, pore fluids, or seawater, where uh, sediments are going to have higher lithium concentrations. So again, maybe we actually get some uh, of a lithium coming from uh, the sediments. It's hard to tell if this is coming from subducting sediments or if this is actually a local process due to some sort of local interaction. And so I'll get back to that in a little bit. And then what I did here was to overlap them on a similar plot that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So here we've got bromine over chlorine on the y-axis and iodine over chlorine on the x-axis. So I showed you where seawater is. The red box is more. Um, these gray diamonds are altered oceanic crust. So I've now put in the little bit of data that we have for these now. The blue dots are all sedimentary pore fluids. Um, sediments fall into this yellow field and serpentinites are in the green field. The black dots are all of these sporic spring samples. And so what you can see is that they largely overlap with sedimentary pore fluids. Um, and they also then stretch over to what we would expect for uh, sediments or sedimentary derived fluid. Okay. And then we're going to look at the isotopes. Same um, on the x-axis, we're looking at uh, latitude going from north to south. And on the y-axis here, we've got the chlorine isotop co isotopic composition, the boron isotopic composition, and the lithium isotopic composition. I showed you in the blue line where seawater is for reference, okay? One of the things that should stand out, and I should have mentioned that before when we were looking at the ratios, is there's not really a trend from north to south. So we see a trend in the concentrations, but we're not seeing a trend in the delta values or in these ratios, which is what I was expecting to see. I was expecting to see a shift in the fluid source. So um, I overlaid sediments and I've overlaid pore fluids. So if we start out thinking about chlorine isotopic composition, all of these values overlap with what we'd expect for a sedimentary pore fluid or marine sediment. For, uh, for boron, they overlap almost all completely with the sedimentary pore fluid. Sediments are gonna be slightly below this off scale. And then lithium, they overlap with what we'd expect for sedimentary pore fluids or um, from sediments. In the case of lithium, previous work has shown that we actually don't lose that much lithium in the very shallow part of subduction. So I think some of this lithium value actually may reflect interaction with local sediments. You can get a lot of absorption and desorption effects. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that the, st the stable isotopic data and the elemental data, it's most consistent with seawater and sedimentary pore fluids, and that there's not a change in the fluid source as you go from north to south along the margin. But we still have this question that I started out with that kind of drove this research is that there's a change in the concentration, and so the question is why. So if there's not a change in the fluid source, I argue that this is a change in the fluid flux and maybe some minor local modification by fluid rock interaction. So, what do I mean by a change in the fluid flux? Okay. So along the Hikurangi margin in the north, the upper plate is undergoing extension. Okay, so the upper plate is going undergoing extension, which means 
that as this plate gets subducted and you kind of squeeze out the slab and you're squeezing out these sedimentary pore fluids, maybe dehydrating some of the sediment, that chlorine is still coming from the sedimentary pore fluid, but it's just going down and it's coming right back up along these normal faults. Okay? Where in the south, the upper, upper plate is undergoing compression. Okay, so there's a lower permeability. And so what happens is this plate gets subducted. Again, you're squeezing out the slab. These sedimentary pore fluids are being released and they're getting trapped in the upper plate. And that's where they get diluted by groundwater, which is gonna have a really low chlorine concentration, for example, okay? So the chlorine and boron and lithium and strontium still can be coming from the sedimentary pore fluids or sediment, but in the south, they're getting diluted by groundwater and not in the north, okay? Um, and I should say that this figure is modified by a figure um, from Laura Wallace. So Laura helped a lot with this. Okay. So now I'm going to get out of my comfort zone a little bit, but I had, I mentioned mass extinctions to make the paleontologist happy. So I have to bring in something to make the geophysicist happy. And so one of the things that I was interested in was seismic behavior along the margin. And can we actually link fluids and fluid sources to some of this change in the seismic behavior? So started getting into some thinking about um, geophysics along this margin. And one of the things is that we can use um, Q, which is the inverse of seismic attenuation. And Q is a proxy for the fluid content, okay? So if you have high porosity or high fluid pressure or just high fluid content, you tend to get high attenuation and therefore you get low Q. So lower Q values, you can think of as higher fluid content or con connectivity of pore spaces, but higher fluid content, okay? And so in this diagram, this is um, a figure by Eberhard Phillips and others. And so what they're showing is um, the Q value at a depth, oh, I, can't, I think this is about eight kilometers in the upper plate. And so, Low Q correlates to the red, so higher fluid content. Um, and so what you can see is that there's a distinct correlation with high concentrations and low Q. So these are our stars and they tend to fall where you see these big angry red patches, okay? So I went to two different places. I looked at Cascadia and that's all the way from like 60 kilometers above the subducting slab up to the arc volcanic front. And I think most of these are higher temperature and we're getting complications from fluid rock interactions. We went to New Zealand, we looked at the very shallow part. And I think really what we're seeing is the squeezing out of these sedimentary pore fluids, maybe some sedimentary component. But I'm now getting interested as like, well, what about in between? Can we actually see like dehydration of sediments again? Or what about breakdown of altered oceanic crust? And so in order to answer this question, I wanted to give you a highlight of some things of some work that I'm going to start. So where I'm going from here. So in order to look at this intermediate area, I'm going to go to Costa Rica. Costa Rica is another place in the world where you get these four arc springs that are located on land. So Costa Rica has all these peninsulas that stick out like the Santa Elena and the Nicoya and the Osa and the Barica. And so we can sample these four arc springs. There's also been a lot of work that have been done on this recently by the Deep Carbon Observatory. And so there's a lot of geochemical data on these already, but not in terms of halogens or lithium or boron. Most of them is focused on nitrogen and carbon and looking at the biology meets subduction initiative. And so here, all of the um, gray circles are all these different springs that are located in the fork of Costa Rica, going up to the arc volcanic front. Um, the gray triangles, these are all the volcanoes. Um, the 
uh, stars are showing historical earthquakes, large magnitude historical earthquakes up to magnitude um, seven or greater. The dashed gray, uh, sorry, the dashed white lines are um, the areas of slow slip or tremor. So just like in New Zealand, we get some slow slip and tremor that's gonna be concentrated underneath the Nicoya Peninsula. And then underneath the Osa Peninsula is where we get the lock zone shown here in the pink. So I'm interested in looking at samples from Santa Elena, the Nicoya. We've actually found some more in Osa and hopefully we can get back there to sample them. Um, and then looking down closer to the Panama border. And so uh, stay tuned for this work. This has um, been funded by Geoprisms and is gonna be part of Jacob Helper's um, master's work. Okay, so just to conclude um, this last part of the talk, and then I wanna have two slides thinking about a little bit more about gaps that I wanna fill in. So we did an overview for the first part, thinking about halogen inputs and outputs via arc volcanism, and they're relatively reasonably constrained, um, but we still have large uncertainties. And one is return to the mantle and what I'm gonna call a slab residue. Also sequestration in the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, sequestration in the continental crust. And then in the second part of the talk, I focused on loss through the forearc. Okay, and so what we saw by looking at New Zealand is that we get shallow, um, uh, in the shallow part of the subduction zone, you expel seawater, sedimentary pore fluids, maybe a little bit of a sedimentary component. In Cascadia, where we're looking at the deeper part of the subduction zone, um, you get some magnetic contribution, um, but it's largely masked by fluid rock interaction. So for future work, I wanna look at this intermediate part of the forearc um, and see if we can actually see like a dehydration of sediments or altered oceanic crust. Um, I just wanna highlight this picture on the back. This is Otapotahiahi. It's on the north end of the South Island and it is this big spring that's kind of like a lake where you have all of these little um, springs that are bubbling up into it. So it's like this cold mud lake that is very, very sacred um, to the Maori people. And so they were very kind enough for me to uh, borrow my waters, borrow their waters. I promise to return them. Um, so another thing that I'm excited about that I just want to leave you with two slides is um, one of the things I'm excited about for the future is looking at these other two questions. So in addition to looking at the fork, I'm interested and excited about thinking about sequestration of halogens in the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, and then also in the continental crust. And so this is all work to stay um, tuned for. So John Laster and myself got funding to look at um, some mantle zealots from the Colorado Plateau and making use of um, Doug Smith's amazing collection. And so this is gonna be part of George, George's PhD work. And then I'm um, also getting excited about looking at halogens in the continental crust. And so doing some work in the Aleutians and in the Sierras. And so that is a proposal that is in prep to hopefully be submitted in the next couple of months. Um, and so with that, I am happy to take um, your questions. All right. Um, so. Jamie, I will read off questions from the uh, that have been con contributed by the audience here. Okay. Audience keep, audience keep on contributing them. Uh, the first question comes from John Walter. Uh, this came, came during your Cascadia part of your talk. Can your values be explained by circulating heated mete meteoric water, leaching boron, lithium, and halogens from high fluid mobile element enriched volcanic ash layers and marine evaporates? evaporites in the uh, four arc? Oh, okay. Good question. So I, don't, I guess I don't have to go all the way back up there. So in terms of thinking about marine evaporites, the answer based on the chlorine isotopic composition is no, because those are all zero. Evaporites are very, very uh, constant at zero, maybe up to like 0.2 per mil. I cannot explain those high values. So not based on evaporites. I have not analyzed the composition of the ashes at all. So I, I don't know about that, but it seems to be consistent with the basalts. But yeah, we would have to do some work on the ashes to answer that one. Great. Okay, then next question comes from Mark Helper, who uh, 
lost track uh, of why the New Zealand cold springs could not be sourced by meteoric driven groundwater interacting with accreted oceanic sediment as opposed to poor fluid dewatering? Oh, good question, Mark. So this is one of the things that always um, bothers me of whether or not it's local or it's coming from subjective. And so there's some, I didn't go into it, but there is definitely a slab component to this because we've got these higher helium values in some of these springs. So there is um, a component to that. I think some of the lithium is coming from the upper plate. Maybe not all of it, but I do think that some of it is. In terms of boron, um, the boron isotopic compositions are, um, they're, they don't really overlap that well with sediments at all. They're pretty consistent with seawater and pore water. Um, and so based on that, there may be a little bit and you can get some of the high boron concentration coming from, but based on that, would argue that a lot of it is still coming from the subducted um, fluids, but that's and that's part of the reason by look by looking at cold springs is that we're really trying to avoid some of those leaching effects um, and doing some experimental work on that. But yeah, that's something that still bothers me to some extent. Okay. All right. Well, I have a question for you, Jamie. Yes. Uh, so the first part of your, your talk is based on these mass balance calculations yes. of stuff going into the subduction zone and what's coming out. And can you talk a little bit more about how you do those mass balance calculations when there's so much that's going on that you cannot see? Yes. Be underwater or deep in the ground? Yeah, so mass balance calculations are useful for thinking about the big picture but yes there's a lot of assumptions that go into them and so one of the for me one of the biggest things that continues to bother me and i am not going to answer this question it's going to be a geophysicist that answers this question is that when we look at the inputs we still don't know how much of the subducting slab is serpentinized um, and so these mass balance calculations are assuming 5% serpentinization. Uh, and um, that may be dramatically underestimating it. And then if so, this piece of the pie becomes much bigger. And that's something that we worry about when we're thinking about lots of different not just halogens, but water or even, you know, carbon or any of that. And so I think we still need to figure out exactly what is getting subducted. This is also assuming average concentrations for these different reservoirs, not taking into account, and, and folks have started to do this with elements like carbon, but it's not taking into account, like I'm just using an average value for marine sediments, but there's lots of different types of marine sediments, you know, and so some of the plagic clays are going to be different than the carbonates and different subduction zones are going to have different proportions of these different sediments. And so then the inputs are going to vary on a subduction by subduction zone basis. And so, yeah, you can start um, making these much more quantitative. Um, and then again, looking at outputs, most of that is based on gas data, right? And so there's not very many places in the world where we do long-term sampling of volcanic gases. Um, most of these are kind of a point in time and an analysis and then trying to scale it up. There's places where we're getting better at that. Like Costa Rica is one of them where they're more well instrumented. Um, but it's still amazing to me that we can actually take a melt inclusion data and try to scale up based on magma production rates and come up with the flux and take gas data and try to scale it up. And a lot of times they're kind of in a pretty close agreement. And so I agree with you doing these mass balance things. There's a lot of arm wavy things going in it, but I think it's a helpful exercise because it helps us recognize what we know and what we don't know. And we can keep adding on the layers of complication. I don't know if that answers your question, but. That's just great. Thank you. <laughs> Your next question is from Tody Larson. Yes. 
who asks, is he seeing it right that lithium has the strongest correlation to sediments, but boron and chlorine could be sediments or pore fluid origin? Right. I think a lot of the lithium is local adsorption and desorption effects. I really, so, and another reason that I'm going to argue for that is that lithium is not lost to great extent in the very shallow part of the subduction zone. You may lose 30% of it at these depths or even less than that, where chlorine and boron, you can lose a lot. And so, yeah, I think that the lithium is reflecting more of the sediment. I think that may be in the upper plate though, and that gets back to Mark's point. Okay. Yeah. Tori says, thank you. And um, now John Lasseter has a question. If you look at individual arcs and individual elements, <laughs> chlorine, fluorine, et cetera, can one calculate inputs and outputs similar to what Planck has done for other elements? And yeah. is there a correlation across global arcs? John, I haven't done that. <laughs> I haven't done that. It's on like the long list of things to do with data that already exists. But yes, I should, I, sh I, I should do that. Um, and yeah, that's one thing I also thought about doing for this review paper that I highlighted some of it in there. And Craig Manning told me the same thing. And that's something for the future. But you're right in the sense that there are variations between arcs, just even if you look at the melt inclusion data and individual volcanoes that I don't understand. Like Augustine, Augustine is so weird and I don't, I don't know why. So like here, so this is just looking at melt inclusion data. And so you can see that there are differences between like Cascades, for example, and the Aleutians compared to like you know, the Marianas or Kamchatka, there are variations. Um, and then in some individual volcanoes, like Augustine has crazy high chlorine. Um, don't know the reason to that. You know, Terry has speculated about why, but she doesn't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll ask a question that Rowan didn't ask because, um, you know, she, she was very supportive with- I wanted to ask that question too, Rich. I wanted to go back to that uh, mass extinction issue. So I hope you're asking something relevant to that. Oh, you can ask that, Liz. Go ahead. Oh, go for it. I just, I wanted to know that as well as, you know, what's your impression? Are volatiles really going to be a major player in, in, these, in, the, in one of the hypotheses for the member <laughs> extinction? Uh. <laughs> Especially after seeing that huge variation, right? A different volcano. And probably in the past, I had the same. Yes. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to <laughs> answer oh. I think I think that this is a super cool study and I will say that Mike and uh, Pete are, are good friends and I think what they did was clever. Um, I'm not sure if I completely buy it based on a handful of samples. So we're looking at you know, a dozen samples or so. And yes, the ones before the extinction had really high concentrations and the ones afterwards didn't. And then they try to scale up. So what would be the volume of the lithospheric mantle that would have to degas? And so um, this is what ends up getting you published in Nature, right? Where you have these really grand conclusions. Um, I think it's a neat study. I don't know if I completely by how much of a contribution it would have. But I gotta talk to somebody like Rowan to see. <laughs> okay, well, Rowan does, I, I, I bullied Rowan into a question. Sorry, Rowan. <laughs> um, but she asks, are, are large igneous provinces going to result in the same degassing of halogens, et cetera, as a downgoing slab? Right, so, um, I don't know how much I would have to think about like the halogen concentration in some of these and the 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 scale, but I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'd have to think about that one some more. I put this one in here to make the paleontologist smile, and then I had to put in a little bit for the geophysicist. <laughs> Well, but the paleontologists have expressed their appreciation. <laughs> Let's see. Any other questions? I can't see y'all's questions, which is yeah, well, which is my MC. Now. No, there's a lot of congratulations, and Rowan's has made me smile. Chris Bell says thank you. Um, all right. Well, I think that that can conclude our DeFord lecture series, and um, I hope to see you guys on Thursday. So I'm going to end the meeting here. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Rich. And thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.